Let's talk about the duration of short-term memory. Research has shown that information can stay in short-term memory anywhere up to about 30 seconds. An experiment done by Peterson and Peterson investigated this. They asked participants to read three letters, then gave them a number and a distractor task. So for example, they might be given three letters to remember, such as W-U-P. Then they'd be given a number, for example, 45, and then asked to count backwards in multiples of three. And that's the distractor task. And this was to stop them from rehearsing the letters that they've been asked to remember. After a set amount of time, they were then asked to recall the three letters. So you can see from this graph here that when the delay was just three seconds, that the recall rate was pretty good. 80% of people got those letters correct. However, when there was an 18 second delay, the accuracy level fell to only 10%. And it continued to fall the longer and longer the delay. So by the time people got to about a 30 second delay, the recall rate was extremely low, close to zero. So researchers started to hypothesize that participants forgot the letters because the memory trace had decayed. Simply put, the information had been lost from short-term memory. In a different experiment, Keppel and Underwood saw that there was actually a difference across the numerous trials. So for example, you can see the same graph. This is telling us the average performance across many, many trials. So on, on the whole, the three second delay was above 80% and an 18 second delay was below 5%. But let's look at the trial by trial data. On the first trial, to the very first time they were asked to remember the letters, you can see that the recall rate for the 18 second delay is actually pretty high. Still not quite as good as the three second delay, but still well above 80%. Then we move to the third trial and you can start to see that the 18 second delay has really started to reduce its recall level. So it's not until participants have gone through subsequent trials that that, that 18 second delay is really coming into play. So what Keppel and Underwood said was that that previously learned information was interfering with learning new information. So by the time we do the first trial, the brains are nice and fresh. By the time we get to the third trial, we've already had to remember two other three-letter words. And by the time we get to the fifth trial, the tenth trial, the twentieth trial, and so on, all that previous learning and memorization is interfering with the new stuff you're trying to cram into your head. To give you a bit more of a tangible example, for example, let's say you're in school and your first class of the day is French. So you go to your first class and you learn French. Then you go to your next class and you're studying Spanish. Then later on the day, you're given a Spanish exam. It is possible that the French that you had learned earlier on in the day interferes with the Spanish that you're currently being tested on. And this is called proactive interference because it's the stuff you've learned before is interfering with the stuff that you learn later. And the opposite can actually happen. So for example, same scenario. So you study French first class, then you study Spanish, but then later on you have a, fr a French exam. It's entirely possible that the Spanish that you had learned later on interferes with the stuff that you're trying to re retrieve from the French information. So it's called retroactive interference. The information you learn afterward interferes with the stuff that you learnt before. So Keppel and Underwood explained the differences on that trial um, data, first trial versus third trial performance, as proactive interference. It wasn't decay, it wasn't simply that information was being lost from our short-term memory. It was more the fact that by third, the third trial, the 10th trial, the 20th trial, and so on, that previously learned information was interfering with new information.
In another study, Wickens et al. looked at what he called release from proactive interference. So participants listened to three words, then they had to count backwards again for 15 seconds and then attempt to recall the three words. But what was interesting is how he set up his experiment. So for example, one set of participants were put into the fruit category. So you can see that on trial one, they had to remember three fruits. Trial two, they had to remember another three fruits. Trial three, another three fruits. And then trial four, another three fruits. So from what we've learned about proactive interference, by the time they get to this trial, their memory should be a lot worse than from previous trials because of all this previously learned information is interfering with this memorization. But let's look at the meat and the profession categories. So in the meat group, a different set of participants had to remember three meats and then another three meats and then another three meats. But on the fourth trial, they switched category and they had to remember fruits. Same thing was going in with the profession categories. Three professions, three professions, three professions. Fourth trial, switch the category to fruit. So what's the result? Let's have a look. So let's break down this graph. In trial one, first time everyone is remembering these three words, the recall is pretty high as we'd expect. The professions group, the meat group, and the fruit group are all well above 80% remembering those three words. We get to trial two, and you can see that overall memory has declined. Same thing, the, the professions, the meat, and the fruit group are now remembering around about 40% or less. And same thing on trial three, we're now getting down to 30% or less on all three groups. So all three groups are suffering from proactive interference. So what's interesting then is on the fourth trial, so remember that the fruit category is the only one that didn't have that change of category. So the recall rate for the profession in the group jumps up. See if you've got this blue bar, 80 or so percent, 35 or so percent, 30 percent, back up to 70 percent. Same thing with the meat group, 80 or so percent, 40 or so percent, 30 or so percent, back up to 45 percent. So they're having a release from proactive interference, that change of category was literally releasing them from that previously uh, interfering information. Only the fruit group didn't have that release and you can see that continuous decline in what they were remembering. So this shows basically how participants use meaning of the words in their processing. So have a think about how we have some of these applications to how you study. Now you know about proactive interference and retroactive interference and the release from proactive interference. Have a think about how you might be able to use this knowledge to create better study strategies.